Hello out there and welcome back to another sparkling new episode of the Rocker Dog Podcast, where our thing is talking to musicians about their dogs. I'm your host, Tim Dill. My dog lurking behind me is Charlie the Golden Doodle. And today we welcome to the podcast drummer Jess Bowen who lends her backbeat to bands like The Summer Set and 303 and was prominently featured in the Netflix documentary Count Me In alongside Chad Smith of the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Stephen Perkins of Jane's Addiction. Jess will be playing drums for Jax on an Australian tour with Simple Plan, Boys Like Girls, and We The Kings for the month of April, and these are her two dynamic rocker dogs. So today we'll be speaking about uh, Tony and Pepe. They're my two little, uh, just Chihuahua mixes, just just little guys. <laughs> okay. And how old is each? So Pepe is about to turn four. His birthday is in a few days. And Tony is three and a half. His birthday is in July. Okay. Now going through your social media, I know you are a bona fide dog lover. And mm-hmm. I've seen you with pit bulls and French Bulldogs, and Beagles, and Huskies, and a lot in between. So how did you land on Chihuahuas for yourself? You know, I think it was kind of just happenstance. Like, uh, so we got Pepe first. My partner and I, Pepe was a pandemic dog. We, you know, just decided we, we, she was kind of looking at some rescue organizations, and then she looked at the Van Nuys shelter, and she saw Pepe's face, and she showed me him, and we both just fell in love. So we kind of called them up to just see if we could meet him. But because it was the pandemic, their rules there were that, like, if you come to the shelter, you're picking up the dog. So (laughs) we made this appointment and we were like, okay, we're going to come meet Pepe. And they're like, so when you come on this date, you're going to come get Pepe. You're coming to adopt Pepe. We were like, oh my God. And I kind of thought to myself, well, we want to meet the dog first, but whatever, we'll just go there and we'll see what happens. And, um, so my my partner went in first, and when she came out, we had to go one at a time again because it was pandemic. They had certain rules. And when she came out, it was so funny the way she did it. She came out and let out this big sigh. She was like, Ugh. and I thought she was going to say, like, we can't get him or there was something that went wrong. She's like, he's perfect. And so I went in and, you know, th- that was obviously her first reaction. And I went in and it was the same thing. Like I walked up to him and his tail was immediately wagging and he put his paws up on me and he was just smiling and licking me. And I was like, oh my God, he's our dog. Like he's, there was just that feeling of he's ours. And, um, and it just so happened that he was a chihuahua. Like we didn't each think like we would end up with a, you know, a chihuahua mix, but he just happened to be the dog that we fell in love with from seeing his picture and then from going in and meeting him for the first time. Right. Um, Yeah. And being a pandemic puppy as a music artist, was that just the only opportunity you're ever going to get in a lifetime where you're going to be locked in and able to care for something for a stretch of time? Is that the was that the kind of the rationale behind it or? (laughs) I feel like people might think that it was, uh, yeah, probably irresponsible because a lot of people were doing that during the pandemic. They were kind of like, oh, like this is my chance to get a dog. But, you know, my partner and I, when I, when we thought about it and I told her there is a world where I'm going to get back on the road, she was really great about like knowing that it was going to be more her responsibility once I was back on the road, because obviously I couldn't take Pepe with me. But with that being said, he's also a small enough dog that I think that kind of worked out to where I was thinking in my head, there's a world where I could also, you know, on tours with my own band, probably bring him along because it's, you know, I have more leeway when I'm with my own band and uh, we all have dogs of our own. So we're all dog lovers. But yeah, I think, I think when we got him, it was originally thinking that, you know, she knew that she would have to take on more of the responsibility once I got on the road again. Okay. And then how did Tony come to be? So Tony, again, so when we did Pepe's, we ended up doing Pepe's, what is it? The dog's like 23 and me, like the dog DNA yeah. test or whatever yeah. it was. I can't remember the name of it, but we ended up finding out that he was fully a Pomchi, Pomeranian Chihuahua, like 50, 50, all the way back to his like great, great, great grandparents. So we were like, oh, my God, we stumbled upon a palm tree and we loved him so much. And basically, because Pepe was a pandemic dog, he did have a lot of anxiety as far as separation anxiety goes. So once we've discovered that, we kind of thought it'd be nice at some point to get him, you know, a friend, like a companion. And we weren't like super serious about it, like initially, but I stumbled upon this post on Facebook. I was in like a Facebook group 
where they were looking for a foster for this dog, Tony. And they said he was a palm chi. And so I showed my fiance, my partner at the time, like her, the pictures of him. And to be honest, she didn't love him very much at first. His owners at the time had like dyed his ears pink and his tail pink. And he just looked really upset. Like he obviously didn't want to be <laughs> dyed pink. So his photo was just really funny to me. And that's like what stood out was he just looked kind of like this, like angry, like, why am I pink, you know, looking dog? So I told her, like, can we at least just meet him? And they're just looking for a foster. So we can at least just foster him for as long as they needed. Just so, you know, Pepe had a friend too. And we could see how Pepe did with another dog. And, you know, fast forward to now, we ended up keeping Tony because we fell so in love with him and him and Pepe, you know, after the initial, you know, how dogs take a little bit of time to yeah. to get to know each other. Now they're literally so bonded. They're the best of friends and love each other so much. So I couldn't imagine not having Tony for Pepe and Pepe for Tony. Now, does Tony have like a resting grump face? <laughs> he does. I think even when he's happy, he kind <laughs> of just looks a little grumpy, you know, and I yeah. just love that about him. Like he... He just has this like s such a unique <laughs> face and uh, he's very expressive. Oh, and also I didn't tell you, we did get him because as in like when I went to go foster him, there, the initial thought was that he was also a palm tree, but we also did his DNA testing and he's not at all a palm tree. He's Is he a mix a of anything mix. besides Chihuahua? So he's Chihuahua and Lhasa Apsa are the most that showed up for him. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, Shih Tzu and Shetland Sheepdog. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah, it was yeah. so funny because, yeah, they were very convinced that he was a palm chi and uh, he's not at all. Pepe is, but he's not. <laughs> and how long transpired between you fostering and you foster failing, so to speak? Um, okay, so we started fostering him when he was nine months old. That was in March or April. I think after about two months is when we discovered that we could not ever like, you know, they, they wanted us to find a home for him, basically. That's why we were fostering him. But I mean, we pretty much I, I didn't even try to look for a home for him. I was like, we're keeping him <laughs> like okay, in my so, mind. I was keeping him the day that we got him. And in my fiance's mind, she was like, no, we're going to, you know, find him his forever home. But then she also was like, we can't. We have to keep him. <laughs> so no inquiries whatsoever came through or there was no meet and greets for him. No meet and greets for him, because, again, like. I think in my mind, I just knew we were always going to keep him. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he did come with his struggles, I think, with his first home. When we first got him, he was kind of, he would nip at people. Like, he wasn't very social. He wasn't socialized. He didn't like people coming up to him and petting him. And he still has his quirks about when he meets people, you know, you need to, especially men, you need to come down to his level, let him sniff you first and do the proper introduction. But once he knows that he loves you, I mean, he's the biggest lover and cuddler in the world. So <laughs> <laughs> now this time last year, were you recovering from surgery? I was. Yes. I had a shoulder surgery. Like a rotator cuff or what was the? Yeah, I had a, um, it was basically like a torn labrum. Um, okay. So I had that, I had to get that repaired in January of last year. Yeah. Because there was a post that you credited nurses Pepe, Tony, <laughs> and your partner for taking good care of you. And I had to ask, really, were they, were they good uh, <laughs> nurses or was it more they were good of getting you out and on your feet sooner than you wanted to be? No, to be honest with you, they got super snuggly. It was like they knew you know, when I came home that they could sense that I was, you know, still in pain and I was really out of it. And they just immediately like that picture that that was posted on my Instagram. That's how they were a lot of the time, because I, I really could only move, you know, for the first few weeks, like from the bed to the couch and I'd have to be propped up. And, you know, I was on the meds, the pain meds. So I was pretty out of it. And um, they would just jump on me like lay, but they knew not to come up in this area. It's like they would just be laying from below the chest and just like cuddle me and sit next to me. And, you know, Tony and Pepe, they just give me kisses whenever they could, but they were really, really, you know, intuitive knowing that I, you know, was in pain and they were like, we're here just to give you the snuggles. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great to hear. Especially, I mean, what a great word is intuitive. It's, you know, sometimes you feel like it's energy and spiritual, how these dogs, you know, know things and know what's yeah. going on with your life. I know it's, it's pretty crazy. So there's a couple of funny quotes I s pulled from your social again. Um, <laughs> and one I see more often than not, but it's uh, from other artists, but it says, I still like spending my time with dogs more than humans. 
Now, does yeah. anybody in your circle take offense to that? <laughs> Honestly, no, because they know me so well and they know that it's like it's not meant offensively to them. It's literally just that I love dogs so, so much and they will kind of always be my priority over humans. <laughs> but no, no, my friends, they like ever since I was a kid, you know, I have loved, loved animals, but obviously dogs specifically. And actually, I think part of that comes from being deprived of having a dog when I was growing up because my mom which I've never met anyone else in my life that has this, but my mom has an actual phobia of dogs. So it's not okay. that she's like literally just scared of dogs. It's a phobia. So if she hears something like keys that sound like a leash, I mean, she literally like will jump. Um, I've seen her jump on top of cars. I've seen her at parties, <laughs> jump on top of tables when the dogs have gotten out and loose because it's just, it's been a whole thing my whole life. Like everyone knows that she's scared of dogs. So if we go to people's houses, the dogs have to be put away and obviously sometimes the dogs have gotten out. So I've seen just like, I've just grown up knowing like you can never have dogs. And so once I finally was out of the house, I think it was just because I was deprived of having the animal that I loved so much. I just, I will always prioritize them now. <laughs> right. Was there any pushback from your family to get a dog? You know, since, you know, it, it, it would affect family reunions and visits and stuff like that. Right. Which it, it definitely does. I actually just came back from the holidays and, you know, I couldn't stay with my parents because we brought our dogs with us. But luckily we had other, you know, my brother lives there so we could stay with him and his wife and all that. But luckily there was no like real pushback. It's not like she was like, no, you can't get a dog. She just knew that it would mean that in certain circumstances, yeah, we can't stay with them as much. Or if we do, you know, we'll have to put them we'll have to get like a dog sitter for them, which we do that quite often. We'll have to have people come stay at our apartment and watch them. Um, mm -hmm. But luckily it wasn't that she was like, you can't get them. It was just, like you said, kind of more, it's good, changes the circumstances. So Yeah. Now the same sentiment of uh, preferring dogs to people, you did a uh, collaboration puppies over people. That was a, a flannel shirt collab with yes. uh, Nick Morrow. Morrow, am I saying yes. that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. This was a while ago, so I'm trying to remember. But yes, that I, I believe that was that was his name. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. I know it was a while ago. What what <laughs> instigated? Did somebody come to you with that, or did, was that your idea, or how did this come to fruition? Yeah. So that specifically, um, it was brought to me by, I, I believe it was a friend of mine named Brittany who was working with another organization called Bark and Bitches is, is mm -hmm. the organization that it was. And she obviously knew that I was, you know, again, I, I make it pretty obvious that I love dogs. And so they thought that it would be the perfect kind of way to raise some money and start kind of like a just a little, it was essentially just to raise, you know, some money for the organization to help out with the dogs and all that. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of made this flannel and obviously I love flannels. So they, we kind of thought, let's mix the two, that's the flannels and then puppies over people kind of with that phrase. Uh, we just kind of took that and ran with it. But yeah, that was just for that one specific organization. And I think we only ran like one line for it, but it was really fun and it was cool, a cool experience. You should bring it back. I feel like uh, flannels really made a, a, a return to style in 2023. <laughs> it has. I know now that you brought that up again, I was like, wait a second, I should, I should partner with another company and do that again. <laughs> And let's talk a little bit about fostering. I know, you know, obviously we, we talked about Tony, but you fostered in the past. Um, there was a dog named Elvis. Yeah. I think this goes way back or not way too, too far back, but uh, around 2015. Yeah. And I noticed you got a lot of pressure on your social media. Like a lot of people, you, you would say, oh, I love this dog so much. I wish we could keep it. And people would be like, you can keep it. You can keep it. And of course you go back to 2015 and you're a full-fledged touring artist. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Tell me a little bit about that time, feeling the pressure and, and did you foster often and was fostering a way to have a dog, but not have to keep it for, you know, having such a transient lifestyle? Yes. Like you said, I was touring so much, especially in that time. I mean, it was literally gone nine to 10 months out of a year. So with Elvis specifically, I did have, like you said, I had a little bit of time off and I've always wanted to help like give back, whether that's volunteering. Um, and I think I had hit up this organization that they specifically fostered like pits and American bulldogs. And so I had asked about how I could help in volunteering. And they actually told me like, well, we need, we literally just need a foster for this dog, Elvis. That's the biggest help that you could be right now if you could foster him. And so immediately I, I just asked my roommate and I was like, 
are you okay with us fostering this dog? I know he's, you know, he's a big, he's a big dog, but like, I'll take care of him. I'll make sure that everything's taken care of. Um, and she was luckily down to do it as well, because obviously he'd be living in our apartment. And that was another situation where we just fell in love with him. I mean, both of us loved this dog so much. And I really, really did want to keep him. But at that time, it would have been the most probably irresponsible thing to do because right. I couldn't give him the lifestyle that he needed. He yeah. also needed a big yard. Like he needed to be able to run around and I could only take him on, you know, like we lived in an apartment and so I would have to take him on these long walks. I'd take him on hikes. I would exercise him as much as I could, but with just the amount that I was going to be touring, like I actually, I knew I couldn't keep the dog and my roommate at the time couldn't either. So we really did try so hard to find him the best home possible. And we ended up keeping him a lot longer because I kept, I luckily at that time I was getting I had some tours that like fell through, like our, you know, the band that I was in, I think we had canceled one tour. So it turned out that I could keep him longer. But then it again came to the point where I was about to be on the road and and we still hadn't found him the perfect home yet. So that was really devastating to have to like, you know, I, I helped as much as I could, but and we tried, we tried so hard to get him a foster. But I will say that when we the the organization um when they took him back. They said that there was a family that was adopting him. So okay. I'm hoping that that was through them, that they did find someone for him. Uh, but they didn't even keep me updated with it, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's funny. I, that, that was one of me, giving me a follow-up question is, do you ever follow up? Not even follow up, but do you ever keep in touch? Or, you know, he's got an Instagram account, so I know he's on a farm having a great life. Oh, that's what's so devastating about it is I don't know if, you know, specifically the organization – just didn't want to share that information. I don't know if the family that adopted him, maybe they didn't want to tell me who they were or something like that. But I remember asking because I'd emailed back a couple times and they had never responded to me. And I don't know if it was also that they were upset with me for me personally not adopting him. There was there was a little bit of that um, that I could feel when I was working with them, with them just saying like, just keep him, just keep him. It was the same as like that, as you were saying, I was feeling that pressure even from them. They were like, well, just keep him. And I was like, you guys yeah. even know my lifestyle. I, I, I can't, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's a yeah. shame because it is, a, it is part of the solution is fostering, you know, and, and many fosters, you know, that's the process. You foster the dog, you get it out of the kennel, you make room in the kennel, and then eventually the dog finds a forever home. So it's, right. you know, I hate to hear the pushback you're getting because you're doing the right thing and more and more people need to do the right thing like that. Yeah, you know, it's like you said, it was really hard because I, I thought that I was doing the right thing and there's, you know, guilt that came with it afterwards. And, and I don't think that's what it should be because like you said, people do need to be fostering. The amount of dogs that I see that are at these high kill shelters and it's like they just, and these rescues that just can't, they can't, they're they're at capacity. They just physically can't take any more dogs. And I'm like, we just need people to like help the fostering part of it. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, it's hard. Well, on a lighter note, gosh, and this goes back to, this goes back 17 years. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it's funny, when I first looked at you, you're, you're so young looking. It's like, how has she been oh. doing this for 17 years? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but you uh, you said, I requested dog to play with on my rider, on the, <laughs> on the tour rider. Did it ever work out? Or did you actually do that? Or was that a joke for a post? At first, it was a joke for a post. And then I did do it as, again, a joke. Because a lot of people will put jokes on their riders just to see yeah. if you know people pay attention to them. So I was like, that could be our joke. And you know what? There have been dogs that come to the venues because what happens is, you know, if there's a person at the venue, whether that be the promoter or like, you know, the sound guy or one of the techs or something that has a dog, they'll bring it to the venue and then we'll get to like play with the dog. So it has happened uh, a handful of times now, uh, ever since I put dogs on the replay her. <laughs> nice. No. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've heard it again and again that it's actually becoming a thing and I'd like to, I'd like to implement it in the venues where I'm at. I also noticed it happening on the warp tour. Oh yeah. For you. Warped Tour. Yes. For me specifically. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think because it's an outdoor festival, it's a lot easier than, you know, when we're playing the club tours yeah. uh, for people to kind of bring the dogs, although it is a hot festival. So they do still need to make sure <laughs> that was the thing. I was like, make sure the dog stays on the bus for the most part and I'll come there. <laughs> <laughs> now have your dogs toured or I know one of them has been on stage. You actually had a bring your dog to work was your kind of your quote unquote, your post. <laughs> and it was a picture of you seemingly near the stage. There was a stage in the background. 
What was the scenario with that? So that was on, um, it was essentially kind of like a warp tour. It was called Sad Summer Fest that my band was playing. And my dogs came to the date that we played here in Los Angeles. So that was the bring your dog to work day. It was just the one day that they could come to. My fiance brought them down with her. And so they kind of just sat on the bus with us for the most part. And then I brought Tony, like the stage was like, yeah, kind of in the background, but I put, we bought them these like, the it was like little ear headbands okay. almost oh, instead of the headphones. Sorry. So it actually like, because we knew they wouldn't keep the headphones on, but they were like these little like doggy head bands that went around their ears so that, you know, they it wouldn't be too loud for them. But uh, yeah, that was really fun to have them there. And they... They really do, like Pepe especially just loves people. So anytime that we bring him places, he's just constantly like so excited to meet anyone and everyone that's there. And do you see, does he have an effect on people? Do you see that they put their guard down? It's, he's a welcome sight. Yes, absolutely. Especially Pepe because he just has, like when he comes up to you, he really just like the way that he looks at you, his smile and with his tail wagging and everything, like there's just something that he does. And like I said, that was like why even the first time that me and, and my partner, when we went in to meet him, it took us two seconds to be like, oh, he's the dog because right. he just has this effect on you. That's you're just like, you are the cutest little guy and the most loving dude ever. So now again, going through your, your socials, there seemed to be another dog that you had a profound relationship with and that was Pippin. Yeah, Pippin. Who is Pippin? Because at one point I thought it was your brother's dog. And then as I got deeper, it seemed to be your dog. So what's yeah, the background it's, on It's what's confusing. The story I know. I've had, I've had a lot of uh, <laughs> connections with different dogs. Uh, essentially, Pippin was from a previous relationship that I had. Okay. Um, and so this was, uh, again, that was even longer. That must have been 2012, I guess, when I adopted Pippin. But my partner had at the time was moving from Nebraska to Arizona and I was on tour a lot. And so her and I had kind of discussed her wanting a companion. So we adopted Pippin uh, together. And so he was our dog. And then she ended up taking him in the breakup, but it was because it just made the most sense uh, mm -hmm. for her to have him. But he was he was also a good dog and he was also a Chihuahua mix. He was like a Coat Did he have like that, that brin yeah, the brindle? Brindle. The brindle coat is yeah. what he had. And he was, um, he was really good looking. He was a he was a cute dog too. Yeah. So I guess I do end up just liking, you know, when I I do lean towards Chihuahua mixed dogs. Cause like now that I think of it, all the dogs that I've actually adopted are Chihuahuas, even though I've, you know, fostered the big dogs like Elvis and stuff. I do love big dogs, but I think there's something about the Chihuahua mixes that just keep getting me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I see, I see them a lot. I see them a lot on the show, and I see, uh, I see uh, the Dachshunds a lot on the show too. It's, it's oh, we love Dachshunds. Yeah, good friends of ours have um, two Dachshunds that are best friends with Tony and Pepe, so they see each other a lot. They have a lot of play dates. <laughs> that's great. Well, I wind down every show with what I call the Zoomies, and that's the last five quick questions. So okay. the first question is: Do you kiss Pepe and Tony on the mouth? <laughs> yeah, okay. I do. All right. Um, you should. Yeah, I do. I, I I don't even like have boundaries with it. I kind of just <laughs> help, Tony will often get his tongue in there somehow. And <laughs> I just don't even care. Earlier today, he even like ate a part of my breakfast, like breakfast, like bagel. And I was just like, Tony, and I took it away from him. And I started eating it still like I, I don't know what it is. I just I have no boundaries with it. I'm like, they're my babies. So I don't now care. with your partner, are you definitely more of the dog person in the relationship? I, so it's funny. She was a cat person before we got Pepe. Um, so she does really, really love dogs now, but I still think I'm, I'm more of the, like I had, I was the first initial person to be like, come on dogs. And then yeah. she now understands it. She loves them a lot. <laughs> okay. Okay. Question number two is, do they have a theme song or like, what would their walk up music to the plate or their red carpet music be? Oh my gosh. I mean, so for Pepe, we've always, since we've gotten him, we always said everyone thinks he kind of looks like a bat. So he, look, he looks like a bat dog. So a lot of times we'll do the na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-na-
Oh, she's sweet, but a psycho, a little bit psycho. It's like an Ava okay, Max song, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So we changed it to, oh, he's sweet, but a, you know, because it's Tony. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> so because he is, he's very sweet, but at first he can look a little bit psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, question three, this goes back to the rider. If the dogs did tour with you, what would they want to have on the rider? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I mean, I think for them, they would want, they love, okay, boys. I know. I know boys. Come here. <laughs> that was Tony's little, he sounds like a, I, love I don't that. even know what, um, like they're trying to tell me what they want on the rider right now. I think they, they really love those dental treats, to be honest with you. You know, those greenies dental mm -hmm. treats. Yeah. They yeah. are obsessed with those. Like Tony goes crazy, like in the mornings over those, like he will do full on just circle after circle until he gets them. That's so I good. feel like we probably put the dental good. treats on there. Cause it's, it's also like a good, good for their a hygiene. Good treat. <laughs> yeah. For their hygiene. So I think to, to not go too crazy with it, we'd do that. <laughs> okay. Question four is, do you use a dog voice to speak to them? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and do you give them a dog voice yes. to speak through them? <laughs> I would say about 70, no, no, I'm going to be real. About 90% of me and my partner's conversations are us talking through the dogs. Um, <laughs> so. That's a healthy relationship. That's a sign of a healthy relationship. Yeah, um, it's really embarrassing. I've never admitted that to anyone, but I feel like this is the perfect podcast to do that on. But I mean, it really is like it's 90 percent of the time we're talking in the dog's voices to each other as if we are the dogs as well. Yeah. So. And what kind of voice? What kind of I, I won't put although you are a performer and I should put you on the spot to do it, at least describe what kind of personality are you giving them? Um, It's like a very high pitched Oh my gosh, I'm, tr I'm trying to to think of how to describe it because it is just too silly. But I mean, it's it's just a high pitched dog voice that we do, and okay. and uh, yeah. But do the two have? I mean, are you giving the two a little bit distinctive styles? So that's the funny thing is that that's that's the thing about um, Pepe gets really upset because he says that Tony copies him, and so that's. Uh, <laughs> That's been the bit that we do is that they both sound the same, but Pepe gets really upset all the time because he's like, mom, he says, he says that yeah. in his voice. He'll say like, mom, Tony's copying me or whatever. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's really embarrassing, but you know, I'm sure every, I'm sure other dog owners do the same, I, right? I, you know, uh, all, all the musicians do the same thing. Okay. Everyone, everyone who's been on the show pretty much speaks to their dog and okay. it's another creative outlet. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it, it, and it's also it would make it would make great content. Like put that up on your uh, your Instagram. I think I just have to let my my guard down, like my wall, and just be like, you know what? I just gotta let everyone see the real me, and that's when I talk in my dog's voices. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Question five: Is there a dog organization or service you'd like to give a shout out to? Um. Yeah. So there's two that I follow that I um, really love. One of them's called a Purposeful Rescue. And mm -hmm. the other one is called Bella Vita Rescue. And they both um they are they both work with um rescuing dogs from high kill shelters. Right. Um specifically in the LA area. I know for um a purposeful rescue, they they specifically focus on the LA area. And then I think Bella Vita Rescue kind of does the whole California region. Um you might have to correct me on that, but those are the two that I follow the most and I um donate to the most at the moment. Um and I think they're doing really great things. Great. I'll get a little bit more information. I'll put it in the write-up for this uh, particular episode. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Well, Jess, you've concluded your first of probably many dog podcasts, and I just want to thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure hearing all about Pepe and Tone and Tone. Tone. <laughs> Tone. Tone. Yeah, Pepe and Tone. Pepe we and Tone. do call them that sometimes, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.